How's everybody doing this evening? Awesome. I see some thumbs up. That's good to see. Thank you for your patience. I apologize for the wait. Uh, sometimes technology works just like it's supposed to. Sometimes it takes a, a extra try or two. Although we're not, we're not, we're not too bad. You know, uh, if if sitting in front of a computer each minute feels like about ten minutes, so I appreciate your patience. I know it's longer when you're sitting in front of a screen, uh, even even when it's it's not as long as it otherwise would feel. You get the idea. <laughs> uh, let's hope I get better at talking, since I'm going to be doing a lot of that for the whole the whole session here. What is in a name? <clears throat> this is uh, one of my favorite topics. I was most excited, I think, for this one, although we still have two more coming up. We're doing this all month of November. Uh, questioning creation. Every single week, we're taking a different perspective at a different aspect of the opening chapters of the book of Genesis, the book that uh, describes the narrative of creation as we receive it in the Torah. This is uh, our third week. We are right in the middle. What's in a name? In the very first Torah portion, in Bereshit, we find this passage right here. Ah, no, I forgot I put an introductory slide in there. Even better. What do I mean, what's in a name? We're going to start from a totally different direction today. This, of course, is from Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. It's where we get the phrase, what's in a name? Juliet says it. Thou art thyself, she's talking to Romeo. Though not a Montague, that's his family name. You know, their families are fighting with each other, if you don't remember your, your or if you never studied Romeo and Juliet in school. Their families, the, the Montagues and the Capulets are fighting. Juliet is a Capulet, and they want to be together, but they can't because of their last name. They don't match up. They're like the Hatfields and McCoys, like the Sharks and the Jets. Someone should make a musical about this. Thou art thyself, though not a Montague. What is a Montague? It's not hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any part belonging to a man. Shakespeare was very big on the double entendre. Oh, be some other name. What's in a name? That's the title of our class. Look at that. That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called. Retain that dear perfection which he owes without that title. Romeo, doff thy name. And for that name, which is no part of thee, take all myself. Romeo responds, I take thee at thy word. Yeah, young love, it's so trusting. <laughs> Call me but love, and I'll be new baptized. Henceforth, I never will be Romeo. There's, there's a reason that Shakespeare is known as this great poet, and Romeo and Juliet is known as this great romantic play. When you actually think about it a little bit, it becomes very quickly not so romantic. But the, the language and the passion is just beautiful, and it's where we get this wonderful quote, what's in a name? Does it really matter? Of course, the message of Romeo and Juliet is that, yeah, the name kind of does matter. You try to ignore the name and you end up with all of these problems because a name carries a lot with it. It's easy for a 15 or 16 year old kid, which Romeo and Juliet are, to think, ah, you know, last name is just a last name, a first name is just a first name. There's nothing really important attached to it. But au contraire, a name actually carries quite a lot. This is from Genesis 2, 18 through 20. This is the passage from our Torah portion. Adonai Elohim said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make an Ezer Konegdo for him. I, I, I decided I did not want to translate Adonai Elohim. I also did not want to translate Ezer Konegdo. 
Sometimes it's translated as helper. Ezer is, is like a, a, a rescue, help, salvation, all of those types of things. You know, when you cry out to God from the depths of despair, what God gives you is Ezer. So whatever word you would use for that, help is not, I, I, I think, a really flat translation. You see, you see a fitting helper is, is a common translation or, or a um, helpmates. I usually translate it a saving counterpart, which is a little bit more awkward to say, but gets at the essence of ezer and konegda, which is uh, neged means across from. So if you imagine, you know, two sides of a scale, one side across from the other, they're, they're uh, equal. We, we say, for example, in our morning prayer, we say, Talmud Torah Keneged Kunlam, the study of Torah Keneged is equal to them all or encompasses them all. That one offsets the other exactly. It's the same word, Kenegdo. So I'm not translating Ezer Kenegdo, but you know what it means. Just don't translate it, helpmate. You'll come up with something better when you, when you bring it to me. I will make for him an Ezer Konegdo. It ends up not being important to our story. I just, you know, that's a soapbox I will get on every single time I come across this verse. And Adonai Elohim formed out of the earth all the wild beasts and all the birds of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that would be its name. By the way, the word man here is Adam or Ha'adam, the man, which is where we get the name Adam. I'm using uh, sort of a standard translation for Adam, which uh, maybe is important and maybe not. We'll see, we'll see in just a moment. For now, I'm, it's, it's a pretty neutral translation. Whatever the man called each living creature, that would be its name. And the man gave names to all the cattle and the birds of the sky, and to all of the wild beasts, but for Adam, no Ezer Konegdo was found. So here we have man and Adam. All of a sudden in the translation, his name appears down here. Although it's, it's sort of, it sort of shows up in here every time it says man and it says Ha'adam. Why does the Torah tell us all this? What is the point of Adam picking names for the animals? It's a good question, right? Could have just left this out and you wouldn't, you wouldn't open up the Torah and say, wait a minute, who named the animals? Would you? Probably not. <laughs> there are lots of things that are not in the Torah. Am I right? There are lot, you, you don't open the Torah and say, wait a minute, where's the Big Bang? You don't open the Torah and say, wait a minute, who, who, who picked the colors of the rainbow? You don't open the Torah and say, wait a minute, this, 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 is, miss this is missing here. Why do, why do men grow beards and, and women usually don't? You know, I come from Florida. That's like a, a center of the, the carnival world. So, you know, you might run into a bearded woman now and again. Probably not so much here. No, but you don't ask this. We don't need an explanation for everything. So if there's an explanation for something in the Torah, it, there must be a reason to it. It has to do with what's in a name. We read in the Midrash. Uh, anytime you see the word Raba, <clears throat> that's a collection of Midrash. This happens to be uh, like the, the, the most major collection of Midrash. <clears throat> I've got a whole, whole stack of them over here. In fact, if I grab one, <clears throat> this, is, this is a set of, of about 10 of these, 10 volumes. You can see it says Midrash Rabbah. This is the English translation. And on the side, it just says the Midrash. So if you're talking about the Midrash, actually there are lots of different Midrash. There are lots of different collections of Midrash uh, that go all the way back to, uh, say, the third century or so, um, over hundreds of years that they're compiled. 
Uh, some midrashim are probably even older than that. Uh, but if you see the midrash, it's talking about midrash Rabbah. And that's exactly where this comes from here. <clears throat> it fits in three volumes of Hebrew, though. So here's Midrash Rabbah uh, on Genesis. So you know which book of the Torah it's talking about. Midrash is always attached to a verse of Torah. That's the nature of Midrash. Usually it's a narrative. It fills in the missing pieces of, uh, of what's in the Torah. It answers questions that we might ask, like why does the Torah care about these names? What does it have to tell us? And... Um, and, and uh, often it fills in narrative details like we have here. Midrash Rabbah is called a Midrash Agadah, which means it fills in narrative pieces. There's also Midrash Halakha that fills in um, uh, explanations of the law. So, for example, there's Midrash that goes with, with uh, the book of Leviticus, which is laws of, of uh, priesthood and purity and so forth. And... Those laws are um, expanded in Midrash uh, Halakha, which is Midrash about uh, laws. But Midrash fills in the gaps in between the verses of Torah, and it's always attached to a verse of Torah. Well, we know what verse this is attached to, because we just read it. God brought the animals before Abraham. God said to him, what are their names? Did Abraham shrug? I don't, I don't know. I, I was just born. Do I look like I was born yesterday? Because I wasn't. I was born today. How, how am I supposed to know the names of the animals? No, Adam understood the essence of each animal and said, this is an ox, this is a donkey, this is a horse, this is a camel. What does that have to do with the essence of each animal? Just wait and see. And you, what is your name? Adam said to God, it's fitting that I should be called Adam, as I was created from the earth. Adama. Adam, Adama. You hear the connection. And me, this is God speaking, what is my name? Adam said to God, it is fitting that you are called Adonai, as you are the ruler, Adon, of all your creations. So now we find out, before this, maybe God had a different name. In fact, maybe God had many names. That'll be a different, maybe one day we'll do a whole unit, not on the Torah, but maybe we'll do a whole uh, unit on mysticism and we'll talk about the different names of God. Where did God get the name Adonai? From Adam. It says it right here. So what does it mean when it says here, in this translation, this is my translation, so you better believe I can back it up. Uh, Adam understood the essence of each animal. You see that's in brackets. It's kind of a leap. If it's in brackets, that means that it's not a translation of any words in the text. It's, it's the, the, uh, um, the implied meaning. That's an awful lot of implication. How do I know that that's a fair translation and I'm not just making things up to add into the text. That would be a good question to ask your translator, right? If you see something that's in, in brackets or bold, you want to say, hold on, justify that. Adam understood the essence of each animal and said, this is an ox, this is a donkey, this is a horse, and this is a camel. Let's take a look at those. Ox in Hebrew is shul, which is related to the word shul, which is a wall. It's a, a, a solid, vertical, you know, what is an ox? You ever, you ever, well, I mean, we're in Texas now. You, you all ever go cow tipping when you were kids? You can't really tip a cow. <laughs> They're huge. And an ox, even more so. You can't, it's, it's, it's a myth, right? You can't actually tip a, it's a 2,000 pound animal you're talking about. Uh, it's like a wall. And that's the essence of an ox as well. An ox is solid. It's not just that it's, that it's big and you can't tip it over, but it's, it's solid. 
It's built vertically. It stands up upright. Uh, some cows even sleep upright, I'm told. Is that true? You guys have a lot more, a lot more cows around here. I did not grow up around cows. What about a donkey? A donkey in Hebrew is chamul, which is related to the word chomer, which is material, it's uh, stuff, right? Stuff or material. What is the essence of a donkey? Is it can carry stuff. It's something that makes it distinct as an animal. A horse is sus, which is related. This is maybe a little bit of a stretch of these of these options. Uh, zoos, which is it's it's not related by the same uh, root word like the other examples, but sus and zoos sound pretty similar, right? There's a there's a phonetic connection here, even though there's there's no linguistic connection between these. The other examples are linguistically uh, linked. Sus is connected with zoos, which means to, to, to move. You know, you go, you, go to, you go to Israel, you know, you, 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 you're, you know, leaving the house, you've got all the, you know, the four little kids, you know, four under four, right? And you say, zoos, 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 zoos. You got you to get going. Come on, kids. It's time to go. Zoos means like move, rush, hurry. Come on. And what does a horse do? What is the distinctive feature of the character of a horse? is it rushes, right? Even when they're trotting, they're, they look like they're just, they're just waiting. They're like, I'm, I'm trotting until I can run. It's natural for a horse. You picture a horse in your mind, that horse is running. That's the nature of the horse. Camel. Actually, the English word from camel comes from the Semitic word. Gamal. That's where we get the word camel. These other words we get from some other places. But camel actually sounds like the, the, the Hebrew word because we, we, it's, it's borrowed into English through a couple of intermediate steps. Camel is gamal, which is like uh, uh, gamal. <laughs> uh, or we say birkat hagomel. A, a blessing for recovery, right? If somebody is, is sick or has just come through an illness or come through a, a dangerous situation, we say a, a public prayer, birkat hagomel, thanking God for blessing somebody for recovering. If you, by the way, if you know of anybody who has recovered from an illness or has gone through a, a difficult uh, physically dangerous time or traveled to a dangerous place and returned, um, uh, you know, gone on a dangerous journey, let me know and we can, we can say a blessing for them in our Friday evening service. We can say Birkat Hagomel for anybody who's recovered from, from illness or uh, returned from a dangerous situation or dangerous travel. That's, that's what we call it, Birkat Hagomel which comes from the same root as gamal, which means to recover from weakness. And what is the distinctive feature? These are all animals that are sort of, if you were to describe them to somebody who had never seen any of these animals before, how would you describe them? You would end up with very similar descriptions for all of these. Okay, it's, it's you know, it's bigger than a person and it walks on all fours and it it grazes and you know it's got sort of a long you know a horse walks into the bar the bartender says why the long face but these i can't believe i got a laugh out of that i i appreciate you so much that was <laughs> that joke is an antique uh you know all of these animals the point is why are these animals mentioned because they're all so similar and yet, if you know these animals, there's no way that you would look at a camel and confuse it with a horse. There's no way you would look at a donkey, even though, you know, objectively speaking, a donkey and a horse might look very similar. But you never look at a horse and say, is that a donkey? You never look at a donkey and say, is that a horse? 
you don't get them confused because they are so distinct in their essence, right? Even though you have these, these four animals that in uh, uh, their physical description, their physical behavior, if you were to list their attributes, you know, trying to describe it to an alien from another planet who was going to draw a picture, you would end up with almost the same description for all of these. But in reality, they're totally different from one another in their very essence. And that's what the name alludes to. So when Adam named the animals, he was, he was not coming up with a word and saying, yeah, it looks like a Steve. I'm going to call this one Steve. It was actually expressing some underlying essence of each animal. And we see that in humans' names as well. One's name has an influence on one's life. This is from uh, where is this from? This is from the Talmud. You see a word, you see a number, and then an A or a B, that's the Talmud. This is from Brachot 7b. This is actually near the beginning of the Talmud, for what it's worth. <laughs> the Talmud's not, uh, you couldn't say the Talmud is really in any particular order, but this is happens to be from near the beginning of the Torah, uh, of the Talmud, rather. According to Jewish mysticism, in fact, this is based on the teachings of Isaac Luria, this is 16th century, when mysticism really, uh, one could argue, sort of peaked. A lot of the, the mystical teachings that we still adhere to today were really developed and, and formalized um, in this period. And Isaac Luria, um, the Ari, he is sometimes called, the, the, the gleaming light, I guess. You, I don't know how you translate Ari. Um, shining light uh, was, was uh, really the one who, who moved, who led the Jewish mystical movement forward in that period of time. Uh, if you're ever in Israel, if you ever, uh, uh, make sure you go to Tzfat. The whole town is, is painted blue. You like, you, you drive, you like, drive around this mountain and you're like spiraling up. You feel like you're driving up into heaven and then you get out and you feel like you've arrived in some other plane of existence. Um, and that's where he lived, unsurprisingly, and a lot of other, a lot of other mystics and a lot of other really important Jewish figures. It's one of the four holy cities of Israel. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's, it's a must do. We're gonna once all of the, once all of this uh, uh, nonsense with this pandemic is over, we're go, we're gonna do a congregational trip to Israel. Um, that's that's like my number one goal. We're gonna we're gonna figure out how to do it, uh, and then we'll go to Tzfat. In Jewish mysticism, there's this teaching that you know what is your Hebrew name? Why do you have a name? That that's what does the name refer to? As Juliet says, it's not your, your face or your hand or your foot or any other part of your body, right? What does your name actually refer to? According to Jewish mysticism, your name, the part of you that your name refers to is your soul. It's the part of you that, that thinks and feels and, and exists uh, with an awareness of your own existence, the part of you when you say I, the part that you're referring to. It's the, the, the I that you, that when you say I, what the I refers to. Yeah, I don't know. You're with me. Sometimes mysticism is hard to express in words. That's what your name is referring to. It's the unique qualities that make you, you. Just like you never look in a mirror and you get confused and you think it's somebody else. Oh, you know, maybe, maybe when you're in your 40s, you look in the mirror and think, oh my gosh, is that my dad? You see it out of the corner of your eyes. Oh my gosh. 
Who's, who's that old man over there? Um, <laughs> I was reading. All right, another time. I've got, I've got, I've got funny stories, but for another time. You're, you're, you don't get confused usually <laughs> when you look in the mirror. Uh, you, you, you think, who is that? Who's that person over there? You know who it is. When you see your friend, you know, coming around the corner, sometimes even way off in the distance, just by seeing their outline and how they're they're walking, you can tell, oh, that's that's my friend Susie, you know, or you know, you, you know, who, whoever it is, you can tell the difference from one person to another, just like you can tell the difference between a horse and a camel and a donkey. And what was the fourth one? An ox. Just like you can tell the difference between these animals that superficially might seem similar. Human beings might superficially seem similar to one another, but in fact, we each have our own essence that makes us unique and distinct. It is said that each person is called by three names. This is from uh, Ecclesiastes Rabbah, Kohelet Rabbah. So this is another Midrash Rabbah. It's said that each person is called by three names, one which they are called by their father and mother, one which they are called by others, and one which they are called in the records of humankind. What do you think this is referring to? You've got your name that your parents give you at birth, one which you are called by others. That might be, maybe you have a nickname. You know, uh, I'm I'm looking to see if there's anyone here that I know has a has a nickname that I can I can pick on, but I don't see any. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, um, I'll I'll pick on our 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 president. Uh, you know, the the president of our congregation is Aladar, but he goes by Ito. That's that's his name. I call him Ito. You all know him as Ito. Uh, you know, that's his name. My family calls me Paletti Spaghetti. Yeah, if you go by, instead of Paulette, Paletti Spaghetti, you've got a nickname, right? Uh, that's, that's something that's, that's a part of your identity. It's something that's earned over time. Um, I don't know what you did to, be, to, to earn Paletti Spaghetti, but obviously it's because you have a fun personality and a good sense of humor. If you didn't, I don't think <laughs> you're shaking your head now. <laughs> well, for whatever reason, there's there's a reason that we 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 have nicknames that we earn in our life. I saw somebody else posted something, but it went away. Um, it could also be a title. You know, a lot of you might see me, and you probably don't say, "Hey, Nathan." Some of you might. You're welcome to. Uh, a lot of you probably say, "Hello, Rabbi." It's good to see you, Rabbi. Uh, that's not my name. But it is my name. It's a, it's a title that I am addressed by others. It could be Doctor, or uh, Mister, or Captain. You know, if you're if you're you know in in uh, armed services, uh, Officer. There are all sorts of different titles that we also use as a name. It's not you, but it represents an aspect of what you represent to others. Teacher or miss. Miss, miss. <laughs> when I was a kid, you got in trouble for calling your teacher miss. Uh, student, stu oh yeah, see, same, same thought. <laughs> We're like on the same wavelength. Chris just said the same thing, you know, sir or miss. Uh, and what is this last one? One which they are called in the records of humankind. What are these records? These records of humankind. It's not explained here, so maybe their Jewish name. Yeah, what are these records? You could say perhaps these are the historical records. You know, how will you be remembered in history? It could be. 
and that's a possibility. You know, when when you say, uh, you know, there are certain names. If you say you you automatically have a um, historical connotation associated with them. If I say Christopher Columbus, everybody immediately has uh, uh, an association, probably an emotional reaction just to hearing that name, even though it's not somebody you've ever met. You've never even met somebody who's met Christopher Columbus. But <clears throat> you would say that he has a name by which he is called in the records of humankind, a reputation, a legacy, right? Or maybe these records are not records of uh, uh, human beings, but maybe these are records about human beings in heaven. Maybe this is the, 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 the record of your life as it's seen by the greater universe, whether that's God or angels or something else, whatever words or ideas you want to attach to that. The records of humankind. Tanhuma, this is another collection of Midrash, your spiritual essence. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's... It is your, your, uh, your legacy or your spiritual essence. Some, some mixture of those things. Midrash Tanhuma. This is another Midrash. Spending a lot of time with Midrash today. Uh, this is not Midrash Rabbah. This is Midrash Tanhuma. It's a different collection of Midrash. There are at least five or six major collections, and there are additional collections beyond that of, of different Midrashim. So this is not the Midrash, but it's a Midrash. Every time a person exemplifies a mitzvah, they earn a good name for themselves. Every person is called by three names, one which they are called by their father and mother, one which they are called by other people, and one which they earn for themselves. In case you were not sure what this means, the records of humankind, this gives you another way from a different source of describing the same thing. It's the name that you earn. The earned name is worth much more than all of the others. And how do you know what that earned name means. It says right here at the beginning, every time you do a mitzvah, every time you do a good deed, every time you fulfill a commandment from God, that is what affects your good name. Every time you violate a mitzvah, every time you uh, violate a trans or transgress a commandment, that affects your good name. You know, that's the implication that's left out here. You wonder why I always uh, uh, look at the world through rose-colored glasses, why I always see the positive side of everything. Uh, you know, I get it honestly. Jewish tradition does this a lot, where, you know, we'll leave out the, 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 the bad implication. We just talk about the good. In Pirkei Avot, adding on to this same idea of three names, or riffing on this theme, you could say. Uh, Pirkei Avot comes from the, the Mishnah. So this is early, this is second century. Rabbi Simeon was, um, I want to say, first century? Someone will look it up for me. I think... First, I think first century, maybe first century BCE. Anyway, Rabbi Simeon said, there are three crowns, the crown of Torah, the crown of priesthood, and the crown of kingship. But the crown of a good name excels them all. Second century, I was way off.
So what is I don't know if it's Shimon Bar Yochai. I could be mistaken, but I think this is a different rabbi. There's a lot of Simons and Simeons and Shimons. I could be mistaken. It might be the same rabbi, but it could be a different one. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll look it up afterwards, but I, I don't know. Um, what is a good name worth? You've got your name and your reputation. What is it worth? Would you say it's worth more than power? Is it worth more than riches? Is it worth more than accolades? You'd say a priest is someone who's elevated. We don't really have priests right now. There's no priesthood. But you would say somebody who's, who's elevated with accolades. What are any of those things worth if you lose your good name? We've seen it happen. We've seen it happen over and over again. Somebody who had plenty of wealth or plenty of power, and through the decisions that they made and the behaviors that they took, lost their good name. And what's left? Nothing. Your name speaks to not just your very essence, and your Hebrew name, it is said, is not just your uh, uh, identity, but it's the name of your soul, and it's the name which connects your soul with heaven. That's the, the, the material that forms that umbilical cord between your soul and, and the divine presence is your name, your Hebrew name specifically. If you're, if you're not Jewish, you don't have a Hebrew name. I mean, you, st you still have a name. Uh, you know, there's, there's a reason that, you know, what are you christened? You know, Christians also have, you know, a, a naming that, that has spiritual significance. Uh, but if you're Jewish, it's your Hebrew name that we're talking about specifically that is this divine connection. There's even a um, tradition, in particular among Ashkenazi Jews, of changing someone's name who is near death. Raul, is this, is this just Ashkenazi Jews or is this Sephardic Jews as well? It's also Sephardic Jews. We have oh, I, I, I couldn't hear you. No, I mean, I, I can't hear anybody right now. My, my audio is, is not set up. But everybody else, I think, could hear you. Everyone else on the Zoom could hear you, just I couldn't. So whatever he said, I'm sure that it was smart, and I'm sure it was right. <laughs> the, the Sephardic also have, when you have a relative or a, a son that is sick, you change the name of the sick person to avoid the angel of death. Thank you. Again, I have no idea what you said, but I can see the reactions of those uh, of everyone else who could hear you um, that uh, uh, appreciated what you had to offer. Uh, that's why. That's why I knew you would know the answer. So uh, I'm 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 being signaled in the chat that it's not just Ashkenazi Jews, but Sephardic Jews as well that will change someone's name. Who is uh, uh, who, who? Who falls severely ill? Um, if you ever fall severely ill and you want to have your name changed, you can give me a call. I would like to come visit you anyway. If you if you uh, fall ill, certainly to come and pray with you. But uh, I've never changed somebody's name. But uh, my great grandfather, great great. Great great or great 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 grandfather, I forget, uh, died when he was eight years old. That's a riddle you have to think about for a minute. How could my great 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 he 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 died and uh, was 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 taken to essentially the morgue or whatever the equivalent of the morgue was 
uh, at that time. And there was a, a doctor, a physician who was coming through who was very well known, and they wanted to show off that, you know, look at our, our you know, incredible uh, uh, facilities here, you know, we're very modern. Uh, and so they took him down and, and they showed, you know, this, this boy, you know, unfortunately just died. Uh, and the physician looked at him and, you know, felt his skin and it was cold and, you know, his eyes were closed, wasn't moving. And he looked very closely and he said, this, this boy is not dead. He's alive. Uh, and this happens sometimes we now know with hypothermia that, um, you know, you're, you're, uh, I'm, I'm told by paramedics that, uh, who deal with hypothermia, uh, they say, uh, you're, you're not, um, uh, someone, um, suffering from hypothermia is not dead until they're warm and dead. because your body temperature can drop and you go into almost like a hibernation, which is what happens to my great, I think it's great, great grandfather. Uh, so they realized that he was not dead. They were able to revive him and he lived on many more years. Um, his name was uh, changed to add a, a Chaim, or at least that's the, the family legend. I have no idea how much of this is, is really true. It's never very, you know, family legend is a funny thing, right? Um, that's what they tell me. That's what they tell me happened. And so that sometimes uh, happens that somebody's name will be changed to signify, uh, on the one hand, a new life, but also out of a superstition that the angel of death will become confused you know, got the, the name on the card. I, I won't make up a name here just in case I'm going to use my own name. Uh, any, any, you know, bad luck I'll put on myself. Put, 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 right? Uh, you know, the, the, the angel of death says, okay, I'm looking for Nissan Gedalia. And he comes in looking and, and I've changed my name and says, hey, are you Nissan Gedalia? No, 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 I'm, I'm Chaim Gedalia. I don't know a Nissan Gedalia. And uh, so, so the angel of death says, oh, okay, I guess I'll move on. Uh, sort of. Um, sort of bizarre to think about. <laughs> like it's almost comical the situation, but that's you know, that's where the superstition comes from. If you change your name, the angel of death won't be able to find you, and it signifies a new life, a, a new rebirth um, that's beginning. Where do you get these names in the first place? Uh, these ne these next few slides I have I have grabbed wholesale from uh, Kveller.com. I think it's .com, uh, which is a website uh, which which has um, it's sort of like the um, what is it called the the bump you know the website for for like babies and and things like that nobody okay uh, there's a, anyway Caveller it's got a lot of great resources for expecting parents and for young parents or parents of young children, um, but it's it's Jewishly oriented. It has a lot of other Jewish stuff on other topics as well. It's got stuff about holidays and it's got uh, articles from different uh, people with whatever their perspective is within the Jewish world. Um, Kavel, Kavel means to be like filled with pride. Right, it's a Yiddish word, Kavel. You know, I'm Kveling, so it's called Kveller, K-V-E-L-L-E-R, E-L. -E -E well, <laughs> I'll have to write it out. Uh, somebody will post it in the chat, I'm sure. Kveller.com, which has a lot of great resources. Uh, it's got a great guide. Okay, there you go. It's in the chat. It's got a great guide for Hebrew names that covers a lot of different names and gives you a little bit of background on different Hebrew names. And uh, this is an article taken straight from Kveller about different naming practices. Ashkenazi Jews traditionally name children after relatives who passed on as a way to keep the memory alive and inspire the namesake to live up to their predecessor's better qualities. Uh, and if said predecessor didn't have better qualities, why would you name your baby after them, right? Uh, my, my great, great uncle, what a complete schmuck he was, you know, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, 
I myself was named after my um, great grandfather, Nathan Farb. That's my name, Nathan Farb. <laughs> we share the same name because I was named after him. Uh, he was Nissan Gedalia. I'm Nis uh, Was he? No, he was Nissan, and uh, I'm Nissan Gedalia. I get a middle name. Uh, I don't know if he had a middle name in Hebrew. He was he was a baker, and again, this is family family legend. Family legend was uh, he he his hands were 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 so tough from hard work in his life throughout his life that uh, he was a baker, and they said he could reach into a hot oven and pull out a a pan with his bare hands just because his his hands were so tough and calloused from hard work. So you know that's a good family legend. That's something good to aspire to. Uh, I've, I've always said, you know, you don't, you, you don't have to be the smartest one in the room. You don't have to be the most talented one in the room. As long as you're the most hardworking one in the room, you're going to go, you're going to go far. Sephardic Jews, on the other hand, seek to achieve the same objective by naming after a living relative. You know, it's like, if you're going to name somebody after me, at least, you know, do it while I'm around to appreciate it. You know, you're going to give me a, you're going to give me an honor. You know, at least I should I should be able to see it. Uh, so there are different customs about naming a child after um, someone who's died or someone who is still alive. In the Torah, both Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews uh, sometimes pick a name from a Torah portion that corresponds with the baby's birth, or a literal meaning uh, of a moniker that embodies a noble or aspirational quality. There are a lot of different naming traditions. Uh, Nisan, my Hebrew name, is, is the month of Nisan, uh, the, the spring month, the month of Passover. Uh, traditionally, it's given to babies who were born in that month. I was not. My Hebrew birthday is not in the month of Nisan. I was named after my um, great-grandfather who, by the way, was also not born in the month of Nisan. How did we end up being named Nisan, Nisan? I have no idea. I don't know. Maybe, maybe generations back, maybe there was somebody who was born in the month of Nisan. Uh, I don't know. Um, sometimes we don't know where a name comes from. Uh, the, the, um, some people choose, you know, if you were born... You know, this this past week we just read Chaye Sarah. Maybe you name your kid Sarah. You know, that would be a good name. Uh, if if you're Sarah, I don't know. I don't know when when your birthday is. If you're named after a Torah portion or not, uh, you can pick a name from the Torah portion. No, <laughs> you can uh, choose a quality. Yitzchak, right? Isaac was named after laughter. That was a quality that was associated uh, by his mother with his birth. So she said, I'm going to name my child Laughter, Yitzchak. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so you can choose a particular quality. Um, Yitzchak, you know, being Laughter or um, uh, Shira um, being Song. You know, somebody who's musical, uh, or uh, you could choose choose a name like uh, um, I don't know. I am completely blanking on on different Hebrew names for for different you know qualities. Bracha, somebody who's a blessing, um, or Baruch for for a boy. Uh, so there are different Hebrew names that could represent a um, particular quality. You could be named after a biblical figure. You could be named after a particular quality. A very popular um, naming custom in modern Israel, especially among secular Jews living in Israel, is to name after uh, uh, you know something uh, in nature. So you could be named, uh, for example, uh, Gal Gadot, you know, Wonder Woman. You all know who I'm talking about? Gal Gadot? She's very famous. Okay. I see most of you nodding. A couple of thumbs ups. Uh, Gal is a wave, like an ocean wave. So you have names like Gal, names like, uh, including biblical names, Asher is a, is a, is a, a type of a tree. Um, uh, um, 
Nahor is a river, you know, sometimes you'll see. A lot of Israelis have names after, uh, um, you know, natural phenomena, flowers or trees or animals. Um, Zev is a wolf. Dove is a bear. Um, and some of these are also are, are not limited to, to uh, Israelis. They're, they're, you know, Arya is a lion. Yes, excellent. See, you got, I've, I've got the right people here helping me teach. Um, so after, you know, animal or, or, uh, um, uh, or something else in nature. These are, these are sort of the, 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 the main ways that uh, your name might have been chosen. Uh, or if you're, if you're, uh, sometimes your, your Hebrew name is based off of your English name. Um, so Gedalia was in honor of my other great grandfather, whose name was George. Um, so they got the, the G sound and that became Gedalia because George is not a Hebrew name. <laughs> it's about as un-Hebrew as, as a, a name could be. There's no Hebrew equivalent, but we took the first initial G and that's where, where I get Nisan Gedalia. That's my Hebrew name. One of the reasons Jewish parents were historically urged to give their children culturally appropriate names was to stave off the threat of assimilation. This is continuing from that article in Cabeller. Of course, considering that according to the Social Security database, where they track everybody's name, uh, among the top 10 2015 American baby names for boys were Noah, Jacob, Ethan, Michael, and Benjamin. These are all Hebrew names, in case you didn't know. The question becomes, who assimilated whom? For girls, the only Jewish, uh, uh, only the Jewish Abigail breaks the top 10 at number seven. Emma was number one. Again, this is 2015 when the article, I guess, was written. Um, and although Emma is used by Jews, and it is used also by Israelis, as, you know, as a modern Hebrew name, it's not technically Jewish in origin. So who assimilated whom? That is the uh, <laughs> end of this session of what's in a name. I know you learned a lot about Hebrew names, a lot about your name, a lot about your identity. And um, if you have any questions or interesting facts that you want to share about your Hebrew name, um, please do now. I'm going to stop the recording and you know, let's, let's hang out. I'm, in, I'm interested in hearing what stories you have.